Welcome to Brevis Talk. The talks you are about to hear will be honest, revealing, and unfiltered. Join us as your host, Pastor Wayne Whiteside, lifts the lid of silence and has conversations about mental illness and health in the church. The goal here is simple. It is to help someone along this journey of life who is struggling. It is to tell the truth to the unsuspecting, and it is to lighten the load of a fellow traveler. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to serve as medical advice or to replace consultation with your physician or mental health professional. If you are experiencing a medical crisis, call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room. Now, here's your host, Pastor Wayne. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You have arrived at another Brevis Talk. We are very excited that you have come our way and you are so consistent in doing so and sharing about these podcasts. As we go into prison all these number of years, I started out as a young man. I don't think I'm so young now. Maybe not old, but maybe not so young. But I've seen some things. I've heard some things, and I want to share them with you. As if you were there, I want to paint a picture, so to speak. Let's begin with a verse of Scripture. This verse comes from the very lips of Jesus, our Savior, John chapter 10, verse 10 tells us, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. The thief, our Lord is talking about the ministry of the evil one, Diabolos, the devil, the diabolic one the one who steals, kills, and destroys in this life. He is the author of that. You will find his fingerprints and his handprints all over that. That is a three-fold attack on people, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus said, I counteract that because I came came to give you life and that more abundantly. Jesus came not only to give us eternal life, but to give us life now, in the here and now, on the way to our eternal home. That word life, I mean, directly the opposite of stealing and killing and destroying. And he says to give it more abundantly. That word abundantly is the idea of filling a cup. There's no way you can get anything more into that cup. And if you continue to pour into that cup, all it's going to do is spill over the edges. It is a full cup. That verse of Scripture is not a pie-in-the-sky, sweet-by-and-by promise that when we get to heaven, we'll have fullness. No, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says it can be had now. What a sad day that our pulpits are not full of the life of God in many places. And therefore, life not being in the pulpit, life cannot be given to those in the pews. We would pray that we would be transmitters, we would be conductors of the life of Jesus Christ, and that we would spill over into our brothers' and our sisters' lives. That is the will of God. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. One of the most unpredictable, potentially stressful, and dangerous places is in the penitentiary, and it is especially around the mentally ill. I've seen terrible, terrible things, confused lives, broken humanity, minds that are not whole, individuals who are walking in a reality, what's real to them, but it does not exist. And while it is true, and if you add the scourge of mental illness, slash that, in the prison, the mentally ill, in the prison, the only thing about the mentally ill that's known is the unknown. Anything can happen on any given day. Please hear me out. You take me to a maximum security barrack, you take me to death row, and it is more predictable. In many ways, it is safer 
than walking with those who have mental illness. The only known is the great unknown. There are two constants among the mentally ill, and one of them is volume or extremely loud noises. I remember being in Arkansas one time for six hours in a particular barrack. Six hours. The sails were on one side, 12 on the bottom floor, 12 on the middle floor, 12 on the top for a total of 36, and then everything around it, everything around it was cinder block walling, and this man, this particular man, screamed at the top of his lungs. I don't believe he ever took a moment's break other than maybe to grasp his breath, and he screamed the whole time, the whole six hours. It is not an exaggeration to tell you that when I walked out of that barrack after six hours, I did, I did, I did have a terrible, terrible headache. The men would try to help him, to encourage him to lower the volume, and all that did was to encourage him. Very, very sick individual. A tormented soul, indeed. Then there's the paranoia. And that makes an individual extremely dangerous when they say when they believe that someone is pursuing them. It could be uh, an individual, it could be federal agencies, it could be the other governments. But they're out to get this person because they have some sort of special knowledge that could change a situation. And those individuals living in that mindset, if you get too close to them and you're not aware that you've gotten too close to them, they can be very. Before I tell you about some of the prison inmates and mental illness, I want to tell you about my first, I believe it's my very first conversation with someone who was having trouble with reality. It was a gentleman I was asked to see who was in the hospital. He just had a few days left, and he was about to step into eternity in the presence of his Lord and his Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, I walked into his room, this kind, sweet gentleman. I walked into his room, and I found myself in the midst of an argument. One of his sons and he were going back and forth, and uh, as they were going back and forth, he noticed. He looked at me. He looked to the left. He said, Preacher. And I said, Yes. He said, Would you do me a favor? And I said, Well, I, if I can. And he said, Would you? Do you see there's a little elephant at the end of the bed? little small elephant, and I'm afraid someone's going to step on him or hurt him. Would you pick him up? My son is arguing with me. My son says that little elephant is not real, but I know it's real. Would you pick him up for me? And so I knelt down, and with a sweep of my hand and arm, I picked that baby elephant up. And he smiled. He was happy. He said, now would you take him over to that table over there, to the far corner of the room? There was a table. And I walked over there purposely, and I lay, gently laid that elephant down on that table. And he was so happy about that. He smiled. Uh, we made a little small talk. And right in the middle of our conversation, he fell asleep. I very quietly put my hand on his shoulder. I prayed a silent prayer for him, and as I was walking out, his son followed me. He said, what do you think you just did? I said, well, I hope I calmed your dad down. I, he said, no, you lied to my daddy. You lied to him. He said, why did you agree with him? I said, well, he was worked up and he was upset, and I felt like the situation just needed to go away. And now he's sleeping, and now he's peaceful, and what sort of surprise or what sort of prize were you going to win by winning an argument with your dad in that condition? I said, if you think less of me for trying to defuse this situation and for, quote, unquote, lying to your dad, I'm sorry. But I do not regret calming him down and the fact that he's now sleeping. Now, there are several stories in this podcast episode. We may make it a two-part podcast episode on mental illness. I'm not sure exactly which what all we're going to speak about here. I'm going to tell you, at least in the beginning, about two inmates that I had. Uh, I knew them, but I didn't know them as well as some of the other ones. But I'll give you some of the quick particulars about them, and I'll let you decide whether you think they have some problems. There's one particular inmate. When he went to trial 
some 30 years ago. He said that he needed to be dressed up like John Wayne. So he absolutely demanded they get him a uh, a hat, a cowboy belt, uh, the uh, you know the buckle, the boots, everything. And then he announced that he was going to defend himself. Somewhere in his trial, he said that one time he had had all sorts of bites all over his body that demons had bit him. And he suggested that he would have bled to death if President John F. Kennedy had not come to him and healed him of all those bites. That was in his trial. That's in his trial record. And he's a raving, crazy man to this day. I don't think anyone who spent five minutes around him wouldn't argue the case with me there. And then I'm thinking about a young man who uh, was arrested. He killed his wife and two children. He took the children's hearts out, put them in a little bag. I, I believe he carried them away. I'm not 100% sure about that. I have to go back and read it. But while he was incarcerated, he pulled out one of his eyes, flushed it down the commode. A few years later, he pulled the other eye out, and he ate it. And the question was, why did you pluck your eyes out? Well, that was his interpretation, his wrong interpretation of the New Testament, specifically Matthew chapter 5 and Mark chapter 9. If your eye offends you or causes you to sin, you pluck it out. And he believed that and he plucked his eyes out. Well, before the question is asked, yes and no are the answers. Yes, I do believe that evil exists in our world, in the lives of people, in their lives. Yes, I do believe there's a great deal of evil within these inmates that I visit and encounter. No, I don't know where to draw the line between what is evil and what is broken humanity. My purpose in telling these stories is simply to tell what I've seen and heard. I am not in a position to even change any of this, to loosen the restrictions of the insanity laws or to tighten them up. I'm just a gospel preacher. I believe that Jesus makes a difference. I believe that Jesus and the good news of him can and does change and help people. Now, I may not have answered all your questions there. I have questions, but I will tell you all of this is above my pay scale. All I know is Jesus is the Savior, and everyone needs a Savior. As someone in yesteryear has said, eternity is too long to be wrong. Let me introduce you to Lynn. Lynn's family remains divided about his case and the surrounding information about his case. When I met Lynn, he was very quick to tell me about his case. He's very eager to have visits. He told me that he killed his wife and one of his brothers. That's why he was in prison. He said, I opened my home to my brother and my wife. He said, I worked 12-hour days, and my wife didn't have to work outside the home, and I love my wife. And he said, but uh, it was not long before my wife and my brother were having in a fair. He said, then they began to poison me. My breakfast was poisoned. My lunch that my wife made me, my coffee that was in a thermos, it was poisoned. My evening meal, he said, I walked around nauseated. He said, I was dizzy and I was very, very sick. He said, and I realized that they were going to poison me. They were going to try to poison me. So I made up my mind that I was going to kill them before they killed me. He said, one morning, and he said, one morning while my wife was still in bed, I shot her in the forehead. And then I put a plastic bag on her head, and I tied it off. He said, I know she wasn't dead because the plastic bag went in as she tried to get another breath. It went into her mouth. He said, then I went to my brother's room, And I said to him, you are a very, very bad boy. Do you know what happens to very, very bad boys? He said, then I shot him in the forehead and I placed a bag over his head. 
He said, I went on to work. He said, but later I turned myself in and told the law, I killed them before they killed me. Well, I visited this man and very peculiar thing here. Very, very peculiar thing. He would only eat items, snacks that I would buy him that were the color orange. He assured me that he knew what orange tastes like, and he could not be poisoned. He could not be fooled. Well, that pretty well narrows the field down. He got Cheetos at every visit, and he received an orange drink, be it a Fanta or a crush. One occasion we were visiting and the vent above us kicked in and little particles of dust came out. I know you're aware that when you pull the curtains back from your home and this, the sunlight is coming in, you might see little things, uh, tiny, tiny little things floating around. Well, that's what we saw. Nothing significant, nothing big, uh, just little things, tiny things floating around. And he asked me, when that happened, would you please lay your head on the table? And I, I didn't understand, but uh, it's uh, he was across from me. He wasn't someone he could, could get me. So he laid his head on the table, and I laid my head on the table. And as we had our heads laid down, he said, you know, they're, they're trying to put someone to sleep. They'll put us all to sleep, but there's really just one person that they're going to come get. And then we'll wake up. He said they need information from someone that they're about to that they're putting to sleep. He said if you lay your head down and I lay my head down, when we go to sleep we won't fall and hurt ourselves. And so he talked during this situation and then he predicted that it was okay and he said, Now we can raise our heads. He said, and play like nothing ever happened. Just play like you don't know. He said, Because if you do if you don't, they'll come get us. And so that happened many times. Today, to this day, many of the family believe that the younger brother was, in fact, having an affair with Lynn's wife. They have told me that that's just who he is. He's just an adulterer. He's a cheat and a liar. He bragged one time to a friend that he had had an affair with every brother of his wife. He had slept with all of his brother's wives, and he bragged about that, according to a friend. Some of the family was just not so sure about that, and they said that Lynn was never the same after he got out of the service. He spent 20-plus years in the service, and they said that the, the old Lynn didn't come out of service. This was a different Lynn. Well, Lynn was always happy to see me. We visited. He tried to correct me about drinking a Dr. Pepper and insisted that I drink something that was orange. And so to comply and not to have any problems, I would do just that. I mean, what's the battle? What's winning the battle there? So I would do just that. Well, several years later after visiting Lynn, I received the news that he had passed away. He no longer would be troubled, his soul would no longer be pained, and he would no longer be confused. I do not say this because Lynn was a tormented person. No, I have full confidence that he trusted that his sins were covered because of Jesus' work on the cross. And I do believe that the goodness of God is greater than the confusion of the evil one. God is good. The devil is bad. God's goodness is so much larger than the devil's badness. Let us now come to the story that I would call, if I had to entitle this portion of our episode, One Happy Day. One Happy Day. Jess was one of three children, born to an absolute bully, a sadist individual with a self-titled machoism. I think he enjoyed beating his children. I think he enjoyed pushing anyone around 
who was afraid of him. I met this biological dad on a few occasions, and that's what he was, a biological dad. Anyone can father a child, but a dad is kind. He provides, he lays down his life, he loves his children. I suspect that this man failed in many of those areas. Whether you feel less of me or not, I wasn't always gracious to this man. He bragged about how he had his children's interest at heart by giving them what he called tough love. To me, Jess was like a little puppy. He wanted a friend. He never gave up on the idea of possibly having a friend, but he was standoffish because he had been so violently abused. Jess was an optimist. He wanted a friend. But Jess would not allow you to get too close because you might hurt him as others had hurt him, especially his dad. And if you did get too close to Jess, as a puppy that is fearful, he had the potential to bite you if you move too fast. I'm not saying Jess is a dog. I'm just telling you, trying to flesh out a picture that you can see concerning Jess. My heart was angry and sad at the same time about Jess. I pitied him. I would listen to some of his most outlandish and ever-expanding stories. He told them better with the telling. Each and every time, they got bigger and bigger and more and more dramatic. But he was in a safe zone, and I simply let him tell his stories. He seemed to enjoy his company with me, and I enjoyed my company with him. I had a great deal of pity for him, but I never disrespected him, I don't think, by just looking down. I think he appreciated it. I really do. On occasion, I did get to see what I will call simply Jess's episodes. He would scream and shout and throw anything and everything that he could that was not fastened or anchored down. He often injured himself in these rages and required stitches. During some of these episodes, he would often be found lying on the floor, lying on his side in a fetal position, drawn up, this man, six foot three, drawn up in a fetal position, crying for someone to help him. Volatile and unpredictable is how he would be described. One day I asked Jess, I said, what's the happiest time you ever had in your life? He looked out, he smiled, he grinned, and he began to tell me about what he said was the very, very best day in his whole life. He said his dad was in a good mood and took him to a river. He said they fished all day and caught some fish. And he said his dad was nice to him. He didn't hit him. He didn't call him names. He didn't make him feel dumb when he asked questions. Jess told me that was the very, very best and happiest day of his life. And he would tell that story every time I asked. I'd say, Jess, tell me that story, that good, happy story when you were on the river that day. And Jess would tell that story and it would get bigger it would get bigger and bigger and it would expand and it and it would expand and he would smile and tell that story when he was upset or agitated i would ask about the river and he would tell me the story of his best day in all his life years ago i was visiting the prison going cell to cell and i remember being in the area close to his cell. I was down a bit, but I was in the barrack of where he was contained, where he was housed. He had become agitated and uncontrollable. An officer I knew pretty well told me that said, he's not cooperating with us, and we're going to have to use force on him. And, of course, that what that means usually is it's time for me to exit and go, and the visits are over with well, I knew this officer pretty well, and he had a little bit of rank. Uh, or normally I would certainly not have asked what I asked. But I offered to calm Jess down. 
I said, I think I can calm him down. The officer looked at me like you were one naive individual. So I continued saying, if you just let me have a chance, I believe that I can settle Jess down, and I'd be happy to try. Well, he looked at me again. He didn't say anything. He said, well, all right, I, um, I'll give you a shot at that. I said, well, I'm going to need a Dr. Pepper. Jess loves Dr. Pepper, and I'm going to need a Dr. Pepper. Well, I had some money on me, so with permission, I went, found a vending machine, found a Dr. Pepper, and I went to Jess, and, well, I gave, got to Jess's front cell. I gave the officer the Dr. Pepper. They opened the what we call the bean hole. That's that place where you slide their plates in for their food. And the officer gave him the Dr. Pepper, and, of course, then they closed it back up. And Jess had the Dr. Pepper. I heard him, the, the pop of the Dr. Pepper can when it opened. And they backed away and were going to give me this shot. I don't know how much time I had. But I said, Jeff, I said, Jess, what's wrong? He said, I'm just mad. I'm angry. I'm just very angry. He said, I want to hurt someone. I said, well, Jess, I'm here and I've got you a Dr. Pepper and before you hurt anyone, before you do anything, I'd like to hear about that river story again. Well, he looked at me, not 100% convinced that that's what I wanted to hear. And so I prodded him. I said, it's not going to hurt anything. Well, you're drinking your Dr. Pepper. Tell me the story again. And then Jess went into that far, far away look as he looked out into nothingness. And he told me about that happiest day in his life, the river trip where his dad was kind to him, spoke to him, didn't hit him, didn't make him feel like he was dumb because he asked questions. At the end of the story, he calmed down. I said, Jess, I bought you Dr. Pepper. I love to hear your stories. We're friends, aren't we? He said, yes. And he nodded his head. I said, well, Jess, I, I need you to do something for me. I've never asked you to do anything for me, but I need you to let these officers cuff you. It'll all be okay, Jess. And so he turned around to the door, and he put his wrist up close to the bean hole. They opened the bean hole. They cuffed him. After he got out of his cell, he told the officers, I'm doing this for Brother Wayne, not you. And we all grinned, including Jess. Well, God bless you. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for listening to the stories. Please tell someone, brevistalk.com, and we'll be back soon with another episode. God bless you, and don't forget, Jesus is Lord. And that concludes our broadcast today. Please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Plus, check us out at our Facebook page or at brevistalk.com and take a look at our blog. And remember, be kind. Always be kind. <laughs>